Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of the Bolt City Podcast. Dave Pallet, Josh Pallet, Mario Heron, talking Charger football with you at least for the next 45 minutes to an hour. Hey guys, we're going to start the show off with a guest. You see him on the screen right now, and it's Chargers senior writer Eric Smith who joins us from Los Angeles to talk about the Chargers and the excitement of everything that's going on kind of in the offseason. And Eric, I want to start off first with the offensive coordinator. I know there's we could go right into the draft, but I want to ask you about Kellen Moore because Kellen Moore comes here with a fantastic resume. Um, I know it's never great to ask for you know somebody's job, but the three of us on the show weren't huge fans of, of the offense last year, and we're really excited, all three of us, which is rare that we agree on something, about Kellen Moore coming to the Chargers. Can you talk about what, what it means having Kellen Moore and why that decision was made by the Chargers to bring him in? Yeah, well, first off, thanks for having me. Uh, I, I appreciate you guys having me on the show. Um, I would agree with you that a change was needed, um, you know, kind of throughout last year as we kind of went along. And it just seemed like the offense never really reached its full potential. Um, and given the playmakers and obviously given Justin Herbert, like it just felt like the offense should have been at another level or two higher than it was. Um, you know, so once the decision is made to move on uh, from the former coaches, um, the fact that we got Kellen, I think it's just phenomenal. Um, I, he was not really someone like on my radar just because obviously he was employed by Dallas. But once he became available, uh, we kind of saw how fast that Brandon Daly and, and the rest of the front office moved to get him. Um, and just like early impressions, like we haven't seen him on the field yet. We've uh, talked to him twice, um, once when he was hired and then once actually a few days ago. Um, he's been great. Like I cannot wait to see what he – like the creativity he brings um, and just kind of what he has in store for this offense, because similar to what I said to start, like, I think we all know that this Chargers offense should probably be top 10, like top five in the league. I mean, they ha certainly have that potential. Um, and Kellen seems like he has a pretty good grasp of, of the talent we have here um, and the playmakers on the roster. And um, it's kind of up to him to make it work, but, um, I think he, he has that potential too, um, and I think it's kind of all all good things ahead. Eric, we always say on this show that draft night is the best night for every team because every team's participating. Every team has a chance on draft night to improve. The Chargers' biggest need going into the draft, we said, was wide receiver. They addressed that need with Quinn and Johnston. Do you think the Chargers had the opportunity to trade back? Quinn and Johnston on a lot of people's boards wasn't the top – three wide receiver in the draft, but the Chargers took him as a number two wide receiver. Do you think that was an option? I mean, I'm, I'm sure like without like knowing for sure, like I, I wasn't in the draft room, but just like in general, usually like at all points of the draft, the GM Tom or, you know, any GM for another team is on the phone with other people trying to maybe not necessarily trade up or trade back, just maybe get a feel for what, what other teams are thinking. So I can't tell you like, yes, the Chargers were looking to trade back um, that we know that they obviously did not trade back. And I think that speaks highly to what they think about Quentin and perhaps like where they had him on their board, because, um, you know, pre-draft, you know, we did uh, position previews looking at all these people and, and Quentin was on, on our, in our article for, for wide receivers. Um, but he wasn't, he was a little bit under the radar, I think, because if you look at like mock draft, it was always Jordan Addison or Jay or uh, Zay Flowers or a tight end. Um, and I think that just goes to show, like, including myself, no one knows anything before the draft. That's, that's just like the fact. Um, so we can have all these mock drafts saying, oh, it's going to be this guy or this guy. But we, we don't know what the Chargers board is. And we got a decent idea that they took Quentin. Right. They're obviously very high on him and everyone is gushing about him. And I think he's going to be a really good player. Um, so I can't tell you for sure it was going to be a trade back. I, I don't know. Um, but the fact they took Quentin, I think, says a lot. We have a running joke on the show where like we like to go back and look at all the mock drafts and see what they got right. And it's just like, dude, it's the biggest guessing game in the world. Like, no, you know, baseball, a baseball player hit the ball three times out of 10 year in the Hall of Fame. So I guess same thing for the mock draft. Um you mentioned Quentin. I kind of want to go into about Quinn. What do you kind of expect from him to bring to the Chargers team? Obviously, he was a big threat in yards after catch, and that's something that really kind of was the shining light about him, and he's coming into a pretty packed receiver room with a lot of leaders. 
So kind of going to what do you kind of see from him? Yeah, I wrote this after the draft. Um, he he's probably not going to start right away, and, and and that's okay. I think a lot of teams draft a first rounder and they say, okay, we're going to plug you in and start right away, and that's something the Chargers have done in recent years, right? With you know Justin essentially started right away. Rashawn was a, a day one starter. Zion same way, but with Quentin, he doesn't need to be wide receiver one right away. We we have Keenan, we have Mike, we have Josh Palmer. He can kind of take some time and kind of acclimate to the NFL, kind of get his feet wet, learn the playbook. That's not to say he's not going to play at all, but there's like a, a ramp up period, I think, for him where he'll be kind of allowed to to grow and ascend kind of at his own pace. Um, obviously, we hope that pace is quick, right, because you want your first round player to contribute and produce at, at some sort of like baseline level. Um, but I, like I said, I wrote after the draft, he's in a good spot because the Chargers are still going to find ways, I think, to get him on the field. And it's not like they're going to ask him to play 90% of the snaps or want him to catch 100 balls. But given that yak you mentioned, um, you know, it was 8.9 8 yards after the catch, um, one of the best receivers in college football if he can have like a package of plays or you know kind of just find his groove or or his niche in the offense he can add that explosive element that we talked about earlier that, that was missing last year um you know and that could just be a slant you know that he takes an extra 20 yards it could be a deep pass like he's got pretty good speed for being 6'3 and, and 208 um he can kind of do it all um and maybe he's not fantastic at any one thing but he's really good at a lot of things and i think like he like i said he, he's in a good spot um he can kind of learn at his own pace and if he can help contribute that should only make this offense better than it was last year eric is there anybody on this charge draft board that the Chargers expect to step in and be a starter from day one i understand there hasn't been even any workouts but is there is there anything that you're writing about going this is a guy that could be a potential starter yeah, only one guy stands out, and it's a guy that I think was a little bit under the radar, and that's uh, Darius Davis. He's not going to start on offense for sure. Like, if Quentin's not going to start on offense, then Darius Davis is surely not going to start on offense. But they said after the draft that uh, Darius is going to be the the punt and kick returner. So he's the guy. I mean, obviously, we lost DeAndre Carter. You know, he was a fantastic player last year, really good, um, especially in punt return. Um but Darius is, is going to be the guy. And as of now, I mean, he's going to start. He's going to be back there week one training camp, like preseason. He's going to be the guy. Um, you know, he's got four, three, six speed, I think it is. So he's very fast. Um, you know, so I used to work for the Vikings before I, I took this job. And I've been around Ryan Ficken for forever. Um, ironic that we both ended up out here. But I have all the faith in the world in Ryan Ficken to really take Darius and take his game to another level. I mean, we saw the impact that, that Ficken had last year, kind of turning around Chargers special teams and making them like a competent to like pretty good unit. Um, I have really high hopes for Darius. Um, I think he, he's going to be really good. Eric, were you surprised that the Chargers did not draft a tight end going into this draft? We all said that tight end was one of the biggest needs. Did that surprise you at all? No, because I'll go back to what I said earlier and that, like, nobody really knows what's going to happen, you know, like, and that includes myself. I did a, a, a mailbag um, article before the draft, and I had mocked a tight end to the Chargers as well. Um, I think I took Dalton Kincaid in the first round. I had traded back and took him in the first round. But I don't know that they're going to take a tight end, and, and no one really does. And just because it's popular – in the mock draft world or what, you know, experts say it's just so different. What's actually in the draft room and what teams prioritize. And even though Tom, Tom Telesco said pre-draft, Hey, this is a great tight end class. And Brandon Staley said the same thing after the draft, you have to be smart with it too. And if you feel like it's not good value or you feel like, okay, there maybe we need a tight end at some point, but, with the way the board is falling, it's not smart for us to take one, then that's the route they're going to go. You know, I think 
you know, pre-draft, um, you, you could almost find every mock that had the Chargers taking a tight end. But again, that doesn't guarantee that the team's going to take one. And while it, and then it makes it surprising when they don't, right? So like, I mean, it could have been the same thing with with, with running back too. Like I know Bajan Robinson was mocked a lot to the Chargers at 21 or maybe like a late round running back. They didn't take a running back either. And people are like, oh, that's a bad pick. Well, we don't know what the board looked like inside the Chargers room. So like maybe they didn't have them graded high. I don't, I don't know, you know? So it's just tough. Like um, I've learned this is like going to be my eighth year covering the NFL. Draft season is so fun just because of the speculation and like, you know, I, I get into it. Like, it's one of my favorite night, nights and, like, times of the year, too. But after, like, the first pick or two picks, no one really knows, like, what's going to happen. And it's fun to guess, but I, I was wrong. I guessed this year I was wrong. So, like, I'm pretty much wrong every year because I, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm not in the, in the, in the room. Um, so it's just fun. And, like, is tight end a need? Maybe. But Kellen Moore stood up here on Monday and said, Hey, we have the guys we have and we're, we're going to make it work. So I have faith in him. You know, he can adapt and be flexible and we'll go from there. You mentioned uh, before you started the show that you were a Vikings rider before you came to the Chargers. And now you got one of your own coming right with you to the West Coast and Eric Kendricks. So what's kind of like that been like? What's he going to bring to the Chargers? Were you surprised at all that he's coming all the way to the West Coast? And were the Chargers kind of losing with Drew Tranquil? Midwest boy, just quick shout that out to Josh and Dave, as I always give them crap that Midwest boys are a little bit tougher, a little bit tougher than the West Coast guys. Um, what what is he when he leaves, walks out that door? What kind of leaves with him? With Drew, yes, yeah. I mean, Drew was a great player and he was a great person. Like I got to know him a little bit last year, my first year. Um, but you know, when free agency kind of started, maybe like pre free agency at the combine. Uh, Kendrick wasn't a free agent. He was still with the Vikings. And, you know, maybe Drew wanted to test free agency and kind of see what was out there for him, which he had earned for sure. Um, and in that in-between period, then Kendrick becomes available and the Chargers pounce and want to sign him because he's a great player. And then there's really not a spot for Drew, right? Because then we brought Kendrick in. So, um, I will miss Drew for sure. You know, am I happy that he went to the Chiefs? No, because now we have to face him twice a year. Um, but I will say, like, just personally having a lot of exposure um, to Kendricks and, like, just seeing him on and off the field, I was, like, fired up when, when, when I saw that we were going to bring him in and sign him. Um, he is a great – I've seen him be a great player in this league, an all-pro, a pro bowler, um, very underrated, you know, like – he doesn't get the recognition maybe like Fred Warner or like in the NFC, like he was always kind of overshadowed by Warner and like Bobby Wagner in Seattle, but he was right up there. He was, he, he probably should have been a pro bowler three or four times in his career and, and he only made it once. So that may be like lessons like his resume per se. Um, but for as much of a great player he is, he is a better person. He is one of the best people that I have, ever come across in the NFL and he will be fantastic for the Chargers locker room. He's not going to be maybe the biggest rah-rah guy, you know, and be like a vocal leader, but he will be there every day. Uh, he will work his, his butt off uh, quietly and he just, he just a, a consummate pro. Um, and I think that like Brandon Daly has referenced it before that leadership is needed. You're always looking to bring in like high end, like top tier quality players like that. So like personally, I was just ecstatic when we when we signed him. Um, obviously, because I, I know him well, and like when he came in the building, like you know, he gave me a hug, and it was like great to see him and all that. But like, just like on the field, he, he's going to be really good. You know, I'm glad you brought this up because this was a big topic of conversation for us on the last show. Is we talked about leadership. You know, I covered this team for. 30 years for ESPN. And over the years, there are guys that stand out, whether it was Junior, whether it was Rodney Harrison, Philip Rivers, Eric Weddle, Nick Hardwick, those guys kind of ran the locker room. And we were, the discussion we had was who runs the Chargers locker room? Do they have those guys? You know, we're all Justin Herbert fans, but from the outside, Justin Herbert doesn't have that take control kind of a deal. Like we're hoping he matures into that. Maybe he's that guy, you know, when the cameras are off, we just don't see it as Charger fans, where we'd say, you know, don't be afraid to demand more from your teammates. 
when you look at this Charger team, you just talked about someone that's going to come in and be big for the for the locker room. Who runs that locker room? You're around that team every single day. Who who are the leaders of this team? I'll give you that answer in a second, but I want to go back to what you said about Herbert. Uh, that leadership aspect of him is, is growing. Um, you know, I knew him from afar or kind of watched him from afar before I got here, but um, based on what I learned and saw and heard last year, Herbert took a big step with his leadership. And maybe that's not like being a rah-rah guy and like getting guys fired up. Like there, there are different ways to lead. Um, but in talking to his teammates, like he is as committed to the team and, and like devoted to his teammates and like does everything possible to like be at his best. Um, and I think just like just his personality too. He's not like, he's surely he's, he's never going to be like a media superstar right we, we see that like he doesn't want all that attention but <clears throat> excuse me i go back to the um the miami game where he um got the game ball from sunday night football and and spiked it in the locker room that's like to me that's a show of leadership and emotion that maybe he he didn't do before um so i think that part of his game is growing even if like it's not widely known it's just it's just quietly on on the upswing um in terms of who leads lead, lead the locker room now it, it's obviously derwin james um he's a vocal leader emotional leader um he is the raw raw guy who will get guys fired up before the game and um just like it's kind of that alpha presence in the locker room um you know he's always ba bouncing around the locker room talking to different different position groups and different guys um he's obviously a captain for a reason so um Ver externally it, it derwin but internally like don't don't sleep on on herbert because he he has grown as a leader from what i've seen and heard hey eric i'll um i'll give you one more question right now after the draft and you know really after free agency where do you see the chargers slotted in the afc obviously the chiefs are in our division we're always looking up to the chiefs you, know, you got the bills you got teams like the jets who just got aaron Rodgers. where would you slot the chargers in the afc yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think they're going to be in the mix. Like, I can't give you, like, a specific ranking or number um, just because you, you you don't know how it's going to play out. You know, there's always teams that have high expectations that that don't meet them. Um, and there's always teams that kind of come out of nowhere that are better than we thought. I think, like, Jacksonville last year, not a lot of people probably pick them to win the the south and then they do and, and they obviously win a playoff game but um you know so i don't know i'd put them like they're definitely in the i mean let's just say the chiefs are in their own tier right they, they've earned that uh winning the super bowl and, and having Mahomes the mvp and all that but like um i put them probably in that next tier with probably like buffalo uh cincinnati jacksonville i mean baltimore you know now they have lamar back um I mean, the Jets, they're going to be like a, not a wild card playoff team, but the Jets are like a wild card in my mind just because of Rodgers, you know, and like how that's going to work. Um, you know, I mean, the thing is, like, you, you look at the AFC, it's like a quarterback heaven, right? Because, like, you have Burrow, Mahomes, Allen, Herbert, Jackson, Lawrence, Tua, right? And then that doesn't even include Russell Wilson. We'll see what he does. Um, and then all the young quarter, all, yeah, all the young quarterbacks that, that just got drafted. Um, so it's going to be crazy. I mean, can I, do I think the Chargers can win double digit games and make the playoffs? Sure. I think that's like a reasonable expectation. But it's just going to be jumbled and crowded because the AFC is clearly top to bottom better than the NFC. And you could be the fourth or fifth, you know, you could be a, a wild card team in the AFC and have, have a better record than a lot of people leading their divisions in the NFC just because it's a, a weaker conference right now. So um, I think the Chargers are going to be in the mix. Um, you know, obviously got to dethrone the Chiefs. That's, that's the goal for sure. Um, and we'll, we'll see if we can do that. Eric, last question for me is uh, Austin Eckler, obviously a big story during the offseason. You know, Austin Eckler, great guy, great story. Uh, all three of us understand exactly, you know, what it means with the running back position and the NFL and, and what the Chargers did. And we don't even disagree. But 
from the outside, it looks like I'm expecting, and I'm sure Mario and Josh probably say the same thing. I'm, I'm expecting the best year we've ever seen from Austin Eckler coming up. And that's saying a lot because I think he falls in the category of what Josh Jacobs did last year for the Raiders, something to prove, something to play for that next contract. And I think the Chargers are in a good situation where I think a lot of Charger fans are concerned that maybe they're in a situation that you might have a disgruntled player, disgruntled locker room. But but I don't see it that way. How, how do you see it as a guy that's around that team and around him every single day? Yeah, I mean, that's a tricky one because, like, the NFL is a business, the, the, the business aspect of it, too. So I can't, you know, he wants to get paid and he wants another contract. The Chargers, you know, have given him permission to seek a trade. You know, it's just kind of the position that they're in right now. Um, in terms of on the field, like, I would never doubt Austin Eckler just – given his background and his upbringing um, and how hard he's had to work to get from where he's at now to where he began as an undrafted free agent. You know, I think he has a lot of pride in his game um, and a lot of pride in himself. And, you know, when he's on the field, he's not going to slack off or like, you know, give anything less than 100 110%. That's just not the person he is. So we'll see what happens with the contract stuff. I mean, that's certainly way above my pay grade. Um, but if he's on the field, like I expect him to produce, and he probably expect the same for uh, himself. Eric, really appreciate your time. This was uh, a lot of fun for us. Appreciate you coming on. We know it's a busy time of the year for you, but uh, we appreciate you giving some insight to what's happening uh, inside that building with the Chargers. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate you guys having me on and uh, happy to join again. Thank you very much. That's uh, Eric Smith right there, senior writer for the Los Angeles Chargers. Nice enough to join us, give us uh, some inside information on what's going on with that team right now. Guys, a couple things, you know, surprised me as far as what he said. One was that the team really didn't draft a guy that is an impact player that's a starter. And, and, and that, again, that's before, obviously, practices have started. You never know who's going to step up and and be that guy. We saw it with the Detroit Lions last year where all of a sudden there's a linebacker, Aiden Hutchinson's the guy everyone's talking about, but there's a linebacker no one ever heard of that steps up to be, you know, number two in jersey sales and as a starter and the coaches fall in love with them. Anything can happen. But I, I find it interesting when we look at a Charger team where we aren't looking at a team that is just trying to make the playoffs. We're looking at a team that I think all three of us believe should be one of the teams talked about in Super Bowl contention to know that they aren't looking to put the finishing pieces on a roster to make that final move for a Super Bowl championship kind of seemed a little bit disappointing and kind of what we saw, I think, when we gave our draft grades out. Yeah, you nailed it right on the head. It was a little bit surprising for a team that is older. You have a lot of older leadership on that team. You think they'd be drafting guys that would be day one starters. To say that the only day one starter that he sees is a fourth-round pick and that's being a specialist. Uh, a little bit surprising. Quinnen Johnston, I was expecting to be an impact guy from day one, but Eric's with the team every single day. If he doesn't think he's going to be a huge impact day from day one, I would believe Eric. To me, like I just said, you you would want to draft a guy that's going to make an impact in the first round, even in the second and third round. You want to draft as many guys, I would imagine, that's going to make an impact from the very beginning. A little bit disappointing. People are killing me in the YouTube comments because I'm being honest, but... <laughs> <laughs> when you see that on every single draft board, Quinn and Johnston is not the second wide receiver. I get it. The Chargers have their guy. If he's not going to make an impact on day one, why would you go there? Yeah, I mean, it's a very good point. It's like, you know, why order a cheeseburger if you're not going to eat it? You know, like, why are you going to get that if you're vegan? It's just like one of those things. <laughs> um, I completely agree. I was surprised he said Davis. I really thought he was going to say Henley. Or Thule, mm -hmm. I have a really strange feeling about Thule. I want to go ahead and I, I, you know, how I kind of pinned myself with uh Bandy and I still would die for the man. I think that's going to be my Thule right now. I'm going to kind of pin myself to Thule, no pun intended, but yeah, I, I'm, with him, you. I'm with you. I'm with yeah, you. Yeah, I think he's going to be the when we look back at this draft, I think he's going to be the best player out of all these guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Mario. Is uh, he's he's the the guy that they chose. Now, look, it's, it's funny, Josh brought up the YouTube comments. You know, if anyone who watches this through YouTube, man, we, we appreciate the comments. We want your insight. We want to know exactly what you're thinking. So uh, feel free, whether you agree with us or you disagree with us, it's, it's all good. Um, but I, I kind of like to get an idea. Are we, are we on the same page with the rest of the Charger fans? Because in reality, most of the people that are, are following the show, they all want the same thing we want. We want to see the Chargers win their first Super Bowl. 
now you know he he spoke about it and we spoke about it before too the afc is dramatically better than uh what's going on in the nfc the competition level with aaron Rodgers now coming to the afc has added another team that you have to be concerned about getting in the way it's um it's a little frustrating you know i'll be honest with you guys i i, I am a, l- a little frustrated with where the chargers are at right now because when you say is this team better than they were when the season ended i can't tell you this team's better than the, they were when the season ended and when the season ended they were a disappointment i mean you, you lost one of the biggest embarrassing losses in postseason history to the jaguars you should have been playing ga- the next week against kansas city at kansas city where we thought anything could happen because they were in both those games right until you know the very end basically and maybe this was the chargers turn Of course, Kansas City goes on and they win the Super Bowl. So to sit there and say you didn't get better just by one or two players is is frustrating. Now, maybe through free agency, they're able to to, to get better. And and I think obviously bringing in Kellen Moore is kind of, in my opinion, is kind of like signing a free agent player. I think Kellen Moore with this offense, I think, makes a big difference as well. At least I hope it does. If it doesn't, man, I'm I'm way wrong. And I think we're going to be looking for, for a new coach, maybe even a new GM. But... This this Charger team right now, I'm, I'm a little frustrated. As we sit there and we do the show on, on May 4th, 2023, I'm a little frustrated going into the season this far out. Yeah, the glass half full approach for me is that the Chargers actually had two first round picks because Kellen Moore is going to make a huge impact from day one. He is the best offseason move that the Chargers have made. So the people that are giving me grief on, on YouTube, which I love, by the way, keep talking trash to me. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad that you guys are watching the show. Here's my question to you guys. The Philadelphia Eagles, most people would say, have the best roster from top to bottom. Would you guys agree? 100%. Yeah. Okay. So the two guys that the Eagles drafted are Georgia players. And I know just because you're from the SEC, it doesn't guarantee you're going to be a great player. But if it's a numbers game and the most players from the SEC make the Pro Bowl and are drafted every single season, you think you'd draft a lot of those guys. Jalen Carter, and I know the Chargers didn't have the option to draft him, was told to me by every single Georgia fan that I know, and I know too many of them, he was the best player on that Georgia defense. One, they won the national championship the first time. Okay? Yeah. He's the best defensive player they had. Nolan Smith, the guy that they got at the end of the first round, he was the number one recruit in the nation coming out of high school. Those are the two players they drafted. And the Eagles already had the best roster in the NFL, and they got better. So don't tell me as as a team like the Chargers, who don't have a roster as good as the Eagles, that we can't get huge impact guys. And Thule, I 100% agree with you, Mario. I think it's going to make a big impact from day one. But we did not move the needle like a team like the Eagles did, and they didn't have the needle to be to be moved forward that much. And then they got DeAndre Swift. The yeah. Eagles got so much better from the Super Bowl to right now, it's not even funny. I think the scary thing about the Eagles is that they improved their greatest, you know, um, part of their team you know their pass rush last year they had the most sacks in the nfl like that was a huge part of their team and they just improved it and then the weakness part of that team was like ah, the running backs aren't great you rely a lot of hurts running and then went and got deandre swift who when healthy is a pretty pretty dominant player and it is a tough one uh, the tcu love is really really funny i'm gonna also mention uh youtube shout out i don't really know how to say your name sir i'm, I'm i really don't want to butcher it like really really badly so i'm just gonna give you the name ak um, but he said, hi, Mario. I have a question, Dave and Josh, or something against TCU players. What happened to Alabama last year? They didn't make it to the playoffs, which good dig. Um, and he makes a point that, you know, no one's going to beat that Georgia team. We don't have to really make this into like a college football discussion. But it's when you make that point, The to the point is the Bamas and Georgias of the world, I'll throw LSU in there for giggles in this. Like, they are dominant programs. You know, Ohio State, like, they're, these are the programs that when they recruit players, it's not, hey, here's $5 million for NIL money. It's here's $5 million, and then you're going to get 20 when you sign to an NFL team when you get drafted in the first or second round. And that's the staple. That's the criteria. That is what happens when you go and play for those programs. You know, at a TCU, it's great. They had their one year, but it's college football. There's always that one team that has that one year where they're really, really good. And then they come back down to earth. It happens college basketball as well. It's the really good programs that stay up there, aka, like I said, Bama, Georgia, State, Michigan, whatever. They stay up there. And it is disheartening to see is that when you see these SEC football games, they say in every broadcast every year, right, in playoffs, like this is like an NFL game. You know, you're having guys that are matched up against each other that NFL matchups. And it's interesting to see like 
how quickly the Eagles go, okay, this is what's working in college football. Let's go ahead and see if it works in the NFL. And now as the play match up the NFL in college, no, that it'll never add up and never be close to the same. But SC is the closest to it. And you can't tell me you're not like a little bit disappointed in drafting three guys from TCU who's had their one good year and they could be great players. They're probably going to be good players. I think Davis is going to be a really good special teams guy. Quinton, I think, will be a great I we look, we drafted a third weapon receiver and we got a third weapon receiver. We didn't say we need a third receiver and we're gonna get a guy that's gonna be a one. No, I think Quinn's a third right third guy, and that's fine. We got him in the first round, a third guy. That it is what it is. Um but yeah, that's all I don't know. That's I probably talked in circles right there, but that's all I gotta say. All right, last thing I want to say on the on the on his comment is this. Two teams had 10 guys drafted from their program. It was Alabama and Georgia. Okay. And again, these NFL GMs, they're they're hired to basically put their teams in the best possible position to win games. There's a reason why 10 guys, because those are the the programs. Those are the guys that have the the best coaching. Those are the guys the special teams coach for the for Alabama makes like three million dollars a year. I mean, it's college football. There are plenty of college coaches out there, head coaches who don't make three million dollars a year. It's it's the the quality of player. It's the SEC. You can go back and look at even when when Josh played at Alabama. I think there are sixty guys from Josh's roster that made it in the NFL off of one team. Sixty, and only eleven guys on each side of the ball, man. That start. I mean that that's absolutely insane. So there is talent in, in the SEC. You can sit there and say there's the SEC bias. No one is risking their job to make the SEC look good. This is what the general managers see. The fact that the that. that the Chargers took three TCU guys is bizarre because the conference isn't known for being any good. And when TCU went up against an SEC school, they got blown out. That's the kind of stuff that makes me a little bit nervous. Alabama not making it in. This is not an SEC show, but I'll say this. Alabama's two losses came on the last play in both games on the road against LSU and against Tennessee. So calm down on that. By the way, I'm a big believer in this. When you take opinion out of everything, Mario, yeah. Vegas isn't in the business to lose money. And mm -hmm. Alabama would have been favored against every single team except Georgia, uh, according to Vegas. That's why they belonged in that Final Four. Right? You're yeah. a gambler. Yeah. Vegas does not give a rat's ass. They do not want to lose money. Yet they would have favored Alabama and everything. Well, you guys got, what, the best like recruiting class ever coming in, too? Didn't you guys just get that? Yeah. Yeah, so, like, yeah. Yeah, so everyone can hop fun. on. Bama now and crap on them, but the, they're gonna have Jesus Christ playing quarterback for the next. Four years or <laughs> so. You know, you know the game. The, honestly, you know what game I'd love to see them replay on TV, and even though it's an Alabama loss, is the game when Joe Burrow's a senior at LSU, and I believe Mac Jones was was uh, was it twenty eighteen? Mac Jones is the starting quarterback who was hurt twenty nineteen, yeah. and you sit there and you go, if you were to watch that game and see how many guys in the NFL are playing for both teams. I, I think every guy who started on both teams is in the NFL. It's it's pretty crazy. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, Philadelphia, again, we think they have the most stacked roster. They had the most stacked roster when the season ended, and they got better. I'm glad Philadelphia is not in the AFC. I'll be honest with you, because I think whoever makes it to the end, now look, things could happen. A year ago at this time, I told you the Rams were the best team in the NFC, but they weren't even close. You never know what's going to happen. That that Philadelphia team is, is is basically built to win for a long time. Yeah. One last thing I'll say about this is don't overthink, and I'm talking like I'm a GM, but don't overthink the draft process. Mario just alluded to it. They're doing the work for you. Alabama's recruiting top players. Georgia's recruiting top players. And then they play each other. And guess what? There you go. It's the closest thing to NFL versus NFL. Why would you not want to go with guys that are showing you the tape? If you do well against Georgia, you probably have a better chance of doing well in the NFL. Don't don't think too much about this. Even Big Ten, and I make fun of the Big Ten all, all the time, Chargers didn't want to go to the Big Ten either. That's fine. If I'm wrong and these guys that the Chargers drafted are great, I'll say it. But for the time being, Alabama and Georgia are already doing the work for you by putting the best players against each other. Mario, you put in uh, our show notes. We do show notes every single time. The awards. The You were talking about Vegas right now. The odds for the awards. Do you want to get into that? Yeah, of course. So um, Vegas obviously puts awards out to come out as soon as the end of the year. But after just the draft and everything, want to look at just awards for some players that we have coming up. So right now, if you go, we'll just I'll just name off like three and then we'll go into it. Um, MVP. This is pretty much damn near a quarterback 
award now. Every winner since 2013 has been a QB. Trivia question. Do you know who was the last non-quarterback to win MVP? That's a good question. Adrian Peterson? Wow, that was quick. Yeah, <laughs> Adrian Peterson. <laughs> wow, good job. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. There you go. Um, so right now, just want to point out like Charger players that are obviously up there on the board. Um, Justin Herbert is currently 9-1 to one to win MVP. Obviously, Patrick Mahomes won it last year. We'll see what that kind of goes on. Let me pull up the full list right here. If you want to know where we get these odds, it's it's the king of sports books, ladies and gentlemen. And if not, if you're betting, you should be betting because it's fun. It's fun, and you should be betting responsibly, and you should be betting with the BetMGM Sportsbook, the king of sportsbook. Uh, right now, the uh, leader for the win MVP next year is Joe Burrow at plus 650, Patrick Mahomes plus 650 as well. Herbert has the third best odds, 9-1. to one. Josh Allen's above him, plus 750. Um, so let's go MVP real quick. And gentlemen, right now Herbert just had surgery. He's recovering from it. Um, how does Herbert, one, win this award do you guys think for next year? Because it's it's MVP is also a very, uh, is it your turn, I guess, in a way too. I like uh, I like the Justin Herbert bet. I'll be honest with you. I think I would I would be one of those guys. And why not? Let's throw some money on Justin Herbert. I like I like that idea. I think Justin Herbert can have a giant year, especially again with Kellen Moore calling the plays. I think Justin Herbert can be the guy. Uh, Dave's right. Justin Herbert's a walking MVP. Everything that he does it makes you think MVP. If he puts more running into his game, smart running into his game, I think that's just going to up his chances even more. And you've got Austin Eckler for maybe one last year, one last hurrah. Like Dave said, I think Austin Eckler is going to have a giant season. Maybe he starts throwing in more touchdowns than Austin Eckler runs them in. And if that happens, then I think Justin Herbert could definitely be uh, MVP next season. Yeah, I agree. I think Mahomes is entering uh, voters fatigue. I think he's entering that realm pretty quickly this early in his career, which like sucks for him because he's probably going to be one of those where should have gotten four, but he got two. Um Burrow at plus 650 feels like he's the one where it's like his time. I guess Josh Allen, you could put that into the argument for Herbert. Like I said, Kel Moore coming in the system. We got him two more weapons in the draft. That really helped to be interesting to see how his odds would have changed if they would have gotten a tight end. But that's food for thought for a different day. Um, plus 900, though, 9 to 1. I actually really like those chances in a division where defenses aren't great that you play two times a year. Something to definitely think about. Defensive player of the year is another one that we actually have two guys, two guys as the Chargers that came up for the award. Um, Dave's sweetheart, Joey Bosa, uh, is 50 to 1 to win it. And then Duran James plus uh, 75 to 1 to win defensive player of the year. Past winners has been pretty much all edge rushers, including excluding Gilmore in 2019, I believe that was. Other than that, what the past nine have eight of the last nine have been edge rushers so edge rushers award pretty much the defensive side of the ball all right well it's not gonna be joey bosa he's not even the best defensive player in his family i mean who are we kidding that it's not joey here's the deal with derwin james though i'll say this i always said since the chargers drafted him when you look at derwin james i always thought he would be eventually a defensive player of the year if he could stay healthy also the other thing is let's be honest here you aren't winning anything unless your team finishes in first place right justin herbert's not winning mvp unless the chargers are in first place you know, and Derwin James, I think, falls in the same category. If Derwin James can stay healthy, and it's always uh, something that we bring up about Derwin, is uh, he definitely could be that guy. Derwin is so impressive to me. I think if we were to ask, you know, a player's only vote, the players wouldn't surprise me at all if the players picked Derwin James. Derwin James is the best safety in the NFL, and he's the best safety. I love Eric Weddle, one of my favorite players of all time. He's the best safety I've ever seen on the Chargers, including Rodney Harrison. I love watching Derwin James play. If I had to pick a favorite for MVP next year, I'd probably go Fred Warner because I think he's head and shoulders above, above the next linebacker in the NFL for the 49ers. The Cowboys just announced that Micah Parsons is going to be a full-time edge rusher. I can't wait to see how that goes. But Derwin James, I think, should be – considered higher than 75 to one as a, as a guy that could win MVP. He does everything. He even gives you sacks. So Darwin James, um, I kind of like that pick. It's not a bad pick for a guy that's 75 to one. God, I'm going to get probably read with the comments for this one. Um, if you're a betting man, I would take Bosa and James and I would not even put a penny on it. Um, Bosa for just the thing of, we haven't really, he gets hurt a lot. We haven't really seen this peak level. We don't really know what 
his peak is right now. Maybe with Tuli on the line and Mac on the line, we finally get his numbers will change. But Duran James, it's not because he's not a good player. I agree with you. He's if not the best safety, he's in that conversation for best safety in the league. He's a hell of a player. It's just safeties just don't win this award. And if you win the award, you have to have seven interceptions. And out of those seven interceptions, six of those gotta be TDs. Like it's it's just it is like that's just how it goes. Or you have to have an insane highlight reel of just big hits, of just shutting down Kelsey. Like you have to have such a big dominant year in order to get that award. That is just it's like almost impossible. It's like a running back winning MVP. Like you gotta be God's gift. You gotta be God's, you gotta come from straight from God's nutsack to freaking get be a running back and to get this award. Like you just have to, dude. Like that's just for MVP. I think it's the same thing for defensive player of the year. You have to. Like it's that hard. I think it's an edge rusher or nothing. The Parsons was a good thing to bring up. Him playing full time edge right now, it's gonna be really, really hard. It's gonna be really hard to not take anyone but Parsons. Do you guys want to look at uh <laughs> all righty? We Go can ahead. look at uh offensive and uh defensive rookie of the year really quickly. Um, gonna offense, pass over I want to talk about what, what, what are the odds on make, Staley? Uh, do you want to say, like, oh, yeah, I want to talk about Tony LeBron before the show ends. By the way, we got to get into this, but you can go, yes, the, uh, yes. Uh, well, hold on. What are the odds okay. on Staley winning coach of the year? 20 to 1. Dan Campbell leads all uh eight to one, then Peyton's no. twelve to one, tied with Eberflus for second with uh twelve to one. Ryan's is fourteen to one, Frank Wright eighteen to one. Blech. Robert uh from um New York Jets eighteen to one as well. Robert Sala. Yeah. Yeah, Robert Sala. Well. Always fair to say his last name. But yeah, so do you okay, quick question for you guys. Could Keller Moore Call such a good game that it like boosts Staley up a little bit to get played, or do you think he would more would just get the um assistant award that they have, which I can't really bet on. As you go offshore, yeah, Brandon Staley's not winning Coach of the Year. I wish. I just don't think he wins Coach of the Year. I just I don't see it. We'll just leave it at that. For me, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I feel like the guy that wins Coach of the Year isn't Brandon Staley. He's not that type of guy. It's always a guy. Who doesn't have a t- great team going into the playoffs, or going into the season? Chargers don't have a great team, but they have enough good players to say they're going to win double digit games. It's going to be hard for him to win coach of the year. Yeah, it's going to be really hard. If he beats Chiefs twice, you think he, he gets up there in top three? So he beats him twice. I mean, to have, yeah, Chargers need to have about 13 wins for him to be considered coach of the year. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. What are the, what are the odds right now in the Chargers to make playoffs? No, odds on wins. Isn't it nine and a half? Nine and a half. Nine and a half. Do you like that number if you were betting over and under? I like it. Over. I'd go. Me too. I'd go over. That's There's what I expect. Lot. Like, I'm expecting a Super Bowl run. Anything less, I'm disappointed. Yeah. A lot, lot of hard road, road opponents. A lot of hard ones. That's fine. They have to be thinking at the same time. The Chargers are coming to town. Yeah. That's, That's yeah. what they should be thinking. The Chargers are coming to town. They got a lot yeah. of weapons. Mm-hmm. Ju- Juice is on the under, so people are betting the under more than the over. I think people That's always fun. do that with the Chargers. People think, uh, you know, obviously history of the Chargers. The Chargers fall short. This is what the Chargers do. They charge it, as you say. Um, I- I'm telling you right now, if I was a team that was facing the Chargers, there'd be so much I'd be concerned about, even as a defensive coordinator. Where, who am I stopping first? Seriously, what weapons am I stopping first? Am I taking away the pass? Am I taking away Eckler? What am What am I doing here? I mean, remember Keenan Allen missed half the season last year. Yeah, this and team stays point, healthy. Yeah. I, I would not want to face the Chargers if I was another team. Straight out, I wouldn't. The Chargers would be one of the top teams I would not want to face. Chargers missed more than than Keenan Allen, Joey Bosa, Rashawn Slater. I think the Chargers could definitely win ten games this year. They should. Yeah, if you're a Charger fan, you should be expecting double digit wins. Not to mention J.C. Jackson, we get him for a full year. You know, that's like the yeah. top paid player that like gets forgotten about because he was hurt to start the year and then he gets hurt again and he's out. We get him that secondary. That's secondary that's going to have to face Russell Wilson and Patrick Mahomes. That's really going to get tested. Be interesting to see. Dude, Jace, look, I'm J.C. Jackson's yeah. the guy that went. Yeah, J.C. Jackson's the guy where you look back at your school yearbook and say, he was in my class. I don't remember <laughs> being in my class. 
Look, he has a lot just, to prove. Yeah. For everybody, everybody. Forget about everything JC Jackson did with the Patriots. Man, we got a whole different player last year. I mean, he was arguably the worst defensive player in the entire NFL. He has a lot to prove coming back in 2023. I don't know why anybody would expect anything different. That's how bad he was. And for him to sit there and go back to the player that he used to be, that'd be great. But right now, I think a lot of Charger fans are like, dude, it's time for you to earn that paycheck. It was a, a goddamn joke. You know, you weren't a mask on Fridays when you're picking up that check because you were stealing money last year. <laughs> I think uh, I think he has a big bounce back year. I, I'm I'm a big JC guy. I think he has a bounce back year. And then we get two corners that can just shut you out with him and Davis on each side. I think it's his big, big, big bounce back year. He looks good, dude. When you see the photos of him training, he looks freaking good. And he's a hell of a okay. player for the New England. Just guess, saying. Guess what? Yeah. I, I dropped a lot of JCs when, every time he got burnt last year. Yeah. watching on TV, a lot of them. <laughs> All right, before we get to Otani, our Otani LeBron debate, um, I just want to mention a quick bet that I would throw right now, and I might actually throw after the show. Ryan's fourteen to one for AP Coach of the Year. If you're a betting person or a state that can bet, and you want to bet on Bet MGM, I would really, really take that. Just for a sole reason, I think they got the best player in the draft, Will Anderson, and you have CJ Stroud, who I think could be a really good QB. And if you have lived under a rock. Every coach, every player that's played for Ryan's when he got that job was jumping for joy, was saying, like, the, you guys have no idea the type of coach you just got. Like, this guy's a killer. This guy's great. This guy's going to take uh, turn around your program. I think that he's definitely worth a shot in that crappy division where you have three first-year QBs, possibly, and then Trevor Lawrence – and the Jags, so that's going to be hard. But you could find a way to sneak up and possibly take that division. If you want just a long shot that you want to mess around with, I'd take Ryan's at 14-1. And I would stay away from Dan Campbell. Stay away from Dan Campbell. If you're if you're going to bet on Dan Campbell for Coach of the Year, go ahead, take the ticket and take your money and light it on fire because <laughs> that's what you just did. <laughs> Real quick, right. Mario, who are the, yeah. who are the favorites? Yeah, who's who's ranked number first, one offense you? and defensive? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh, for rookie? Okay, my bad. Yeah, um, you're good. Offense, it's Robinson, Texas, plus 300 right now. Then Bryce Young, CJ Stroud, Jackson Smith, and then Gibbs. Ryan's up the top five. Chilling right outside. Mm -hmm. the oh, Anthony Richardson's tied with Gibbs, plus uh, 900, 9 to 1. Then Jordan Addison, Zay Flowers, and then Quentin Johnson. If awesome. I was betting, I'd take Gibbs. Gibbs would be my guy. The Lions will, will feature yeah. him. I would take so it. Wait, hold on a second. Wait, hold on a second. Where does Quentin Johnson rank in the offensive rookies of the year? Uh, just... one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, ninth. And he was the twenty-first pick. Yeah. All right. All right. I mean, he's like, but like honestly, though, he's not going to get any touches. Like, if you're making a thing, like, in order for him to get this award or just to gain momentum for the award, Allen or Williams have to go down. I don't want that to happen, but I'm saying like that that, that that's gonna have to it could happen. happen. It I could think, happen. I mean, yeah, it happened, could last, happen. happened last year. Happens a lot. Yeah, actually. yeah, no, yeah, a All lot, right. a lot. But yeah, but then Eckler would have to lose takes on in the passing game, and then it's like what, what if Josh, Joshua yeah. Palmer? I'm still upset happens. about what Eric said. I'm just upset about what Eric said. I'm not gonna be able to sleep tonight. He's that's not okay. gonna be an impact guy day one. All right, defense. Sorry, real quick, defensive. Who do they got? Will Anderson. Defensive. Give me one second, because I think that was taken off the board. No, it's not. Hold on. Give me one second as I find it. I go Will Anderson. Season awards. Me too. Right. Will Anderson. I, will, I, will, I checked. Yeah, Will Anderson's a clear. Oh my God. He's a clear favorite. Plus yeah. 340. Jalen Carter, plus 600. Tyree Wilson, Christian Gonzalez. Devin uh, Weatherspoon, Lucas Van Ness. Now, if you're going to take a ticket on Van Ness, you should take the ticket, then you should punch yourself in the face, then you should ask your girlfriend to slap you in the face. So that's single-handedly the dumbest thing you could ever do in your freaking life. Do not take that bet. Do not take him at all. Do not take him. That is not a good bet. It's not a good bet. Wins, dude. Dude, it's he's not gonna win. I I will die on that hill. He won't win. Oh, you have man. so much better. So Brian Branch is a better bet. Like Carter's a better bet at six to one. He's only gonna get shorter. Tyree Wilson's a great bet plus seven 
Witherspoon at plus 1100 at Seahawks defense is a lot better bet. Van Ness is not a good bet. Joey Porter Jr. Sorry. Joey Porter Jr. Oh my God. Yeah. In the Steelers offense, are you kidding me? Like, my Lord. Thule. Yeah. Absolutely. 80 to 1. No, 80, 80 to 1. Sorry. All right, let's 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 do this because Dave and I are on the same side. You're on the opposite. Actually, I'm in the middle. I'm not going to say I'm on a side. I'm in the middle. I don't know what side I'm had. on, man. I, I can go back and forth on this. This is this is really? a great question. I think okay. this is a great question. It is a great question. So the debate that we had in our group chat, best group chat that I'm in. I'm in some terrible group chats where I'm just like, <laughs> I'm in this group chat. But it's uh, we have a good one going, the Bolt City podcast. So the debate was, what's more impressive right now? Shohei Otani hitting and pitching at an elite level in Major League Baseball or LeBron James still right there towards the top of the NBA at 38 years old in the playoffs with the Lakers? Mario, I know you're very, very adamant about your opinion. What do you say? Mm -hmm. It is without a doubt (laughs) Shohei Otani is the most impressive thing we've seen in all of sports, dude. The fact that the only thing we have to compare to Shohei Otani was a guy that was probably a little hungover walking out into the mound as he was throwing maybe 60 miles per hour and hitting 50 miles per hour baseballs is the only thing we have to compare. And, you know, 1902, right before even the first World War, I don't know when Babe Ruth was alive. It was early. Like, (laughs) the fact that that's the only thing – yeah, that's the the fact that that's the only thing we have to compare – to Otani with, I think is insane. He's a unicorn of the sport. He, the thing he's doing right now where he's literally leading batting and pitching, like that's insane. We'll never, we'll never see that again. We will never see that again with LeBron. LeBron's exceptional. He's one of the, he's the greatest second best player in all of sports. He's so good. He's amazing. It's fun to see. He's doing great stuff for the Lakers right now. I think he has a lot more left in the tank for these playoffs. I think he's coasting right now. He's going to explode one game, and it's going to really hurt my feelings because I don't want the Lakers to do good. But also the thing with LeBron is only more guys are going to play as long as he has. Like That's only more are going to come. Like if you, if you don't think Giannis is going to play as long, I think you're wrong. If you don't he's think – He's not. I would guys argue, over seven feet tall break down after age 31. Yeah, try technology in five years. Like, I, I really, okay. I promise you, like, the progression of guys playing longer and staying their prime longer is going to happen. Steph Curry, dude. Steph Curry. Giannis dude. eats Oreos every night. He's not playing until age 39, 40 years old. Who are you, a chef? You don't know who he eats Oreos? I, like, I, I've kidding? seen the press conference. He When he discovered Oreos, he's like, why have you guys hit, hit, uh, held this back as a secret for so long? The guy's dipping Oreos like a madman. Not going to play until age 40. Oh, I forgot Oreos is a cramp up, and then you can't play in the freaking NBA it's, anymore. It's, you have a, Oreos. it's sugar. It's a sugar. Yeah, sh- dude, okay, let me finish my thing. All right, okay. easy. You sound like now we got a whole nother bet. Now we got um, a whole nother bet. Yeah, look. Yeah. So all I'm saying is that it's only going to continue. If you don't think Giannis is going to play longer, you're wrong. Steph Curry is 30. What four years old? No, he's 30. I think he's older than that. He's like 34, 35. How old is he, Josh? Josh knows How old is Steph Curry? Usually. Yeah. I think he's about 35. I'll, I'll double check right now. 35. Yeah, 35 freaking years old. And he plays like he's 25, running, sprinting around the court, setting screens, rolling off screens, fading, popping, sprinting up and down the court. He makes a 26-year-old tired. So my point is that what LeBron's doing is very impressive. He's the best second player, second best player of all time in every sport. But the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of other people will be in their prime as they move forward just because of technology, just because he set the blueprint of that. So since because of that, it's way more impressive with Otani. It is 10 times more impressive with Otani. All right. So I'm just going to say this, okay? And it's funny. I had this discussion yesterday with somebody because this was in our group text. Is right now, as a sports fan in Southern California, if your sports entertainment dollar isn't going to basically – Every Laker game you can catch or Angel game, you're out of your mind. It's right there in your own backyard that you're literally looking at your version of Babe Ruth. To go to an Angel game, Mario, you're, I know you're far away. It's like, it's nothing, man. Angel games are very inexpensive, but you have a chance to see not only Babe Ruth, but you also have a chance to see Mickey Mantle at the same time. Mike Trout's numbers compared to Mickey Mantle's numbers, and they're both there. The Angels stink, I understand, as a team, 
But at the same time, you're seeing two of the greatest players of all time that you have a chance to be entertained by in Otani. Otani is a freak. And look, I'll, I'll tell you right now, Otani is the greatest baseball player of all time. No offense to Babe Ruth, not his fault. He played in an all-one-race one league. It was an all-white league back then. Now you look at Otani, it's a global sport. What Otani is doing as a pitcher and as a hitter is absolutely incredible. That being said, as impressed as I am by him, I can't believe what I see when I see LeBron James. And just like I say with Derwin James, when you see Derwin James in person, it is night and day from what you're getting on TV. It is so impressive to watch what Derwin James does to feel like he was in the offensive huddle before the play starts. LeBron is the fastest guy on the court. I don't think people realize Jordan was also the fastest guy on the court. People go, you don't know what you're talking about. I, dude, I, I saw a ton of Jordan games. Jordan, man, his breakaway speed, the way he was able to get to the ball, it was incredible how quick he was. LeBron, Josh and I went to watch him play against the Celtics last year. And I, I, was, I was amazed. I'm looking at Tatum and I'm looking at Jalen Brown and I'm looking at Anthony Davis. And I'm going, LeBron's the best player on the floor at this age. And you look at the way he's built his body. He's, he, he's a freak show. LeBron is, is absolutely amazing. Now, Laker games are crazy expensive. I think the, the, the highest price for game three, when the Lakers played the Warriors in the playoffs, is a $39,000 to go for one ticket to go to the game. Crazy. Now, that's, that's club fees money for, uh, for, for Mario right there. That's towel fees money. <laughs> But for the rest of us, we can't always afford to go. But if you have a chance to go see LeBron in person, man, do it before the show is over. Go do it because, man, he's 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 absolutely incredible. Uh, but again, whether you're a baseball fan or not, to tell your your kids, your grandkids that you had a chance to see your version of Babe Ruth, man, you're you're missing out. Otani is a freak show. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna say Otani's more impressive for the fact that nobody's done it. Even in Babe Ruth, Babe Ruth was playing against certain races back then. I'm, I'll just keep it at that. Otani's playing against everybody in the world. <laughs> it was one race, it was yeah. one race. Yeah, that's what I'm. I know. I get it. okay. Otani's doing it against everybody. We saw it on the World Baseball Classic how great he is. The fact that Los Angeles, and we've said, said this before, Mike Trout is basically Mickey Mantle. He's an afterthought. Mike Trout's an yeah. afterthought in Los Angeles or in Southern California. Justin Herbert, who's nine to one odds to win NFL MVP, is an afterthought in Southern California. The amount of talent that's in one area of the world is amazing. And if you're not, if you're in Southern California, you're not taking advantage of seeing guys like Clayton Kershaw, Mike Trout, Justin Herbert, Aaron Donald, a Anthony Davis. Some people would say he's the best player in the, NF in the NBA at, at points. You're missing out. So take advantage of it if you're a fan. You might not you might not ever see this again, and I don't think you will. In, in five years, we're going to talk about the time that Otani and LeBron both played in the same area. I think it's amazing as a fan, and you should definitely take advantage of it. Yeah, speaking from a kid, half across the country, definitely take advantage of that. Um, especially because Otani, Otani might be gone after this year. He will be. Yeah. It'll be up the freeway in LA yeah. with the Dodgers. Which kind of sucks. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be the I Dodgers. I don't know if he's going to I don't know if he's going to the Dodgers, Mets, wherever the hell he ends up. But you're right. You, uh, there's no guarantee. Cubbies. But you're looking at six hundred million dollars. I will say this about Otani, all right, in your argument for Otani, Mario. Yeah. Otani is three players in one. Okay. And yeah. I'm like I'm the only guy that ever says this. When I say three players in one, obviously he's an all star pitcher, all star hitter, but he also gives teams the ability to carry another roster spot because he's taken up two spots. Do you understand? He's yeah. given you three guys on your roster because you have them. He's absolutely incredible. I, I'll say this for the LeBron thing too, is what, what, what will really settle the argument. I mean, we've kind of made this up as this a debate, but like it's very clearly that the past two, three years of Tani's the best player in the MLB. Like LeBron hasn't been the best player in the NBA in three years now. Two years. He, the first time he's never gotten received an MVP vote. They said. Yeah, yeah, this past year, but like I, like I, I wouldn't say he's the best player in the league in 2022. I wouldn't say he's the best player in the league in 2021. In 2020, I, I would. You could make an argument he was not either. So that's the other thing too is how long can you go? And I mean, it's it's the same thing. You make the argument with Kobe and uh, MJ crap, where like how long was MJ was purely the number one player in the league? How long was Kobe? the purely number one player in the league. And he gets kind of dented because he, of the times he was in. Um, so it'd be interesting if Otani, how long he does stay as a number one best player in the league. And it's crazy that three years in, he's probably the best player of all time. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Is, is that I just amazing? angered a, how many Laker fans I just piss off I don't right think, there. Yeah. I don't think there are a lot of Laker fans, honestly pissed off. I think it's a, it's a great argument. I think for Southern California sports fans, even if you're a Dodger fan and you hate the angels, 
you sit there and go, what he's doing is incredible. Also, I think most can you hate the Angels? Believe he's going to want to dodge. They Angels? do. Yeah. Dodger I mean, like the Angels are so bad. If you, do you hate the Angels? That's a that's a youth problem, dude. The Angels are so bad. <laughs> feel bad. Everybody feels bad for the Angels. They don't even you talk know? crap like the Clippers. You know? No. Like they, don't, yeah. <laughs> they don't talk. They don't no. talk. Or anything. Yeah. yeah. No. So no, I cut you no, off, but if you pick, if you pick you on the Angels, that's a you problem. They already have enough problems yeah. over there. Don't pick on the Angels. Come on now. Yeah. Yeah. It, my my so. feeling is yeah, it's true. I mean, the Dodgers obviously are the premier team in LA for baseball. You know, it's not even it's not even close. The Lakers are the premier yeah. team in LA for basketball. Anyone who's a Clipper fan, it's just you're a jerk. You're just I'm just gonna be different. You're a jerk. <laughs> I love when they in, in crypto arena, Mario, because you're far away. But yeah. so they cover all the Laker banners when the Clippers play and they put up pictures of the the Clipper players because they don't have any banners, obviously. Yeah. And uh, they, they always when they do the transition, they always say, all right, time to take the selfies down. Time to show the banners again. <laughs> as, as the Clipper pictures come down of, of everyone they've ever had in the past and whatever. It's, it's a joke, man. It's a yeah. joke. I, one of my jobs was I covered the Clippers back when they were at the L.A. Sports Arena in the mid 90s. And they had a coach named Bill Fitch, and they lost like 17 games in a row to start the season. And he says, Dave, because our team's so bad, we're the only team that can lose 17 games in a row and then go into a slump. (laughs) (laughs) They play guess the tenants, and you can literally sit in your seat and point your finger and just start counting and going, dude, I know exactly how many people are. There's like 702 and maybe a few in the bathroom. Like there's 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 nobody here. (laughs) There's there's nobody here. It was it was insane. Yeah, it was it was nuts. Real quick, we're on the topic. It's this time of year. Uh, NBA Finals, go. Did not get Celtics go against Lake. Yeah, so yeah, if I was if I was betting, I'd go Nuggets Celtics. I'm with Josh. Nuggets really? are outstanding, and uh, obviously, here's the deal, man. As a Lake lifelong Laker fan, been a Laker fan longer than both of you guys have been basketball fans. Before you guys were even alive, obviously, diehard Laker fan is. Um, I waited my whole life for the Lakers to have as many championships as the Celtics, and now they do. It will drive me crazy if the Celtics get one up on the Lakers. Whatever happens, I can't have the Celtics win the championship. It's, it's like my life goal for the Lakers to have more championships than the Boston Celtics. <laughs> I, I've i said multiple times to you guys, I think Lakers, no shot. They make it out of the West. Do they beat the I'm, Warriors? I'm Mario? a little bit of a believer. I think they – I think – what happens is they take Warriors in seven because I think Warriors are just going to get tired. Then I think they, I think Jokic first AD is a bad matchup for Jokic. I think it's going to suck for him. Um, and then I think they go, they go through that whole gauntlet and then Celtics beat them in five. Celtics beat the Lakers in five. I think they beat the hell out of them in five. Oh boy. Okay. Who's guarding AD? I think what? Yeah, Who's guarding Anthony Davis? Robert Williams. Robert Williams. Al Horford's a great defender. I thought Grant Williams. That's the three-man rotation. Who's going to guard Tatum and Brown? Derek White. Vander- Ever heard of Vanderbilt. Jared Vanderbilt? Yeah. Okay. Best defensive player in the okay. league. Oh, okay. Here. Let's debate. That, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. Old man so, Steph Curry. Shut I'm down old joking. Man Steph. I'm joking. Okay. But he, he okay. Jared Vanderbilt is a top he's 10. A dog. If you're in top perimeter yeah. defenders, he's up there. He's up there. I, I'll give the, you without a doubt top five. Yeah, yeah, he, he's he's good. The if there's a possibility for a bad matchup for two players, Jokic is a bad matchup for AD, and AD is a bad matchup for Jokic. AD doesn't like to get touched, and Jokic is right there as the strongest player in the NBA. Jokic also can't jump, and AD is a freak of nature. So I think it's a bad matchup for both guys. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's why I I, I, uh, the, I uh, Laker. My buddy's a Laker fan, and he told me that Jared Vanderbilt's. Uh, best defender in the league, bar none. And I was like, bar none, buddy. Let's take a breath. Let's see it. He's a yeah. great defender, but I don't what know about bar none. Steph was impressive in game one. That might be it was, different it was. in game two. Yeah, it was impressive. very impressive. Very impressive. Yeah. Yeah. But By the way, the, di- the, the, the difference the, time. the difference in, in shape of these NBA players, and I know we'll wrap the show up, to watch Steph Curry just to get open for one shot and how much running he does through all these screens to get open just for one shot is amazing. Yep. Then I'm watching the Padres in Mexico City last week. Manny Machado hits a double. <laughs> he needs 15 minutes to catch his breath. That's to call time and walk around and touch his knees. I'm like, dude, 
watch Steph Curry. You can't, when you compare the two as far as baseball and basketball and, and in the kind of shape you have to be in, it was, it was crazy to watch. But yeah. Steph is amazing. Just to get open to get a shot is incredible that he runs through like five screens. Mm-hmm. Amazing to me. I love the NBA. I love the NBA when my teams are in it. Mario, you wouldn't know what that's like being a Bulls fan, but it's pretty exciting. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll, we'll get out of here. We'll get out of here. Not a lot. Not too much hate in the show. It was a good time. All right. Thanks again for listening to the Bolt City Podcast. Again, you can watch on YouTube as well. And, and if you're watching on YouTube, please uh, feel free to leave a comment. We don't mind. We don't get our feelings hurt. Linux boxes aren't too expensive. We're okay. Uh, again, for uh, Josh Palais, Mara Heron, I'm Dave Palais. We'll, we'll talk to you next time on the Bolt City Podcast, courtesy of Odyssey.